philosophy of uh, Basel, which is called uh, in French, Le Rire des Verts. I'm sorry, I mean, okay, which in French is called Le Rire des Verts, uh, which would translate to mining the coming, comic verse. And I will be discussing how we tag humor and maybe a little bit more than humor. So the when you first think about it, the link between verse and humor seems to be non-existent. Uh, they seem to be at uh, opposing ends of the spectrum in the hierarchy of uh, literary forms, um, but they share a number of features. In particular, their departure from a bona fide communication, both verse and humor, both poetry generally and humor, um, ha um, harness the language shortcomings in order to create a layering of meanings. They use a familiar monotonous backdrop in order to create something incongruous or unexpected, uh, and they favor ambiguity instead of trying to produce a very precise and easy to understand material. Both of them also have a high focus on the control of the creator over the material and issues of tempo. So both of them regularly violate crisis cooperation principles, which say that you should make your contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. Both humor and poetry tend to typically violate those uh, maxims and uh, instead of avoiding obscurity and ambiguity, they favor it in, in order to produce uh, collisions in the meanings. Um, just to note that I have put your faces away, I can't see any of you, which is a shame for me, but also if some of you happen to raise your hands, I wouldn't see you. Um, so, if you look at the commonalities between uh, verse and humor, you can see that sometimes the structure of versification is used in order to produce the humor. It's the case here in those two lines by Raymond Queneau, where the reader accepts uh, the lines to rhyme because of our prior knowledge of versification rules. C'était autant que notre espèce ne se voyait pas encore la face does not rhyme. And so the reader automatically involuntarily replaces the non-rhyming word fast with the similarly sounding rhyming word fest, the behind, uh, thus producing a joke whose very existence is based on the, the mechanism of the joke is based on the mechanism of versification. In this other example of a collision between uh, humor and verse, the um, this is a play by Edmond Rostand called Cyrano de Bergerac. It's a dialogue, and it's a dialogue in Alexandrine, the most classical French uh, meter, except here the Alexandrine, which is not unusual in theater, the Alexandrine is completely split between the two uh, speakers so that it completely disappears. The, the audience cannot perceive the Alexandrine in this dialogue. Um, except at the very end of the dialogue. So this dialogue is a bit confrontational. The two men are not agreeing. One of them, the powerful one, wants to be friend with the less powerful one, but the less po powerful one wants to appear brave and so rejects this uh, friendship until at the very end, he understands how much he needs Cyrano and uh, decides to play nice eventually. And then he reverts to a perfectly regular Alexandrine, comme je suis heureux, monsieur, de vous connaître. And so this um, back and forth movement between a complete destruction of the classical meter and a return to its uh, very regular structure, familiar structure. Here is also a, a joke that is played by the author, a joke on versification. Versification is partly the topic of the, of the joke. Um, or the support of it. Here, in this example of the same play, the versification is exactly the topic of the joke. Um, those two lines are said by uh, Cook, who has a passion for poetry, and he tries to bring together his two passions, the verse lines and the poetry, but he does that so clumsily that uh, trying to make something very poetic out of his uh, cooking activities, all he manages to produce is an outrageously um, sexual uh, double meaning. And uh, so the, the joke again is about the topic, the very topic of versification, the hemistitch, 
the caesura. Um, now, moving away from jokes, strictly speaking, there's also a very large number of uh, figures of stylistic features that you find in uh, poetry and that also rely on diversification and function in the same way as jokes. In this case, the collision between uh, voler and voleur, which sound almost the same, but have uh, very different meanings. One is the one means flying and the other means stealing. The two verbs voler and voler, to steal and to fly are perfectly homonyms. And the uh, voltiger, voltiger, which also has two meanings, to flutter and to be a soldier. Um, this uh, collision of uh, incompatible meanings is typical of the, the structure of a joke, because in jokes, typically you overlap two incompatible meanings. Um, and then the understanding of their incompatibility creates the joke. So, um, oops. Okay, so this project is funded for five years by the Swiss National Science Foundation uh, through a PRIMA grant. And the, it is hosted at the University of Basel in the French Studies Department. And we are five on the team. Apart from me, we have a postdoctoral researcher, Niels Couturier, a PhD candidate, Lara Nug, a programmer, Petr Plerach, which is a, outside of my project, not just a programmer, obviously, as most of you know, but he's doing all the programming in the project, and uh, Pascaline Noricou, who is the assistant. So together we collaborate quite closely with two laboratories in France. One is based at the University of Caen in Normandy, uh, and uh, our, in our contact there, Richard Renault is developing a program called Malherbe, which uh, automatically analyzes very finely the features of uh, verse. So we have to provide them with a number of uh, prepared texts, well formatted, and then they can send us back an annotated version of those texts with very fine annotations about diversification. And the Frontex team at the University of Lorraine uh, where this is where the last physical edition of Plotting Poetry happened actually in Nancy. And the front text is uh, the biggest French speaking textual database. It's historically very important because it was, uh, it was founded, I can't remember when, but decades ago. And uh, it was quite a pioneering institution. So the objectives of our project are to try and find out what are the most used versification features that happen alongside humor, such as, of course, meters and jammers, caesars, rhymes. Uh, we're interested to find out if there's a regularity in the forms that the poets, not just the poets, because we're not just uh, studying uh, lyrical poetry, but uh, also the theater writers and the songwriters are uh, which metrical features they're using and on which metrical phenomena they rely in order to create their jokes. But we also want to then go and see which other contexts use the same features to see if there's a link to be found there. Uh, we also want to look at other stylistic devices that share the same structures as, of, as humor. So we're not focusing our description of humor on whether or not it's funny, of course, because that would be very difficult. And we're not even focusing on whether or not it's a joke, because it is also is difficult to tell, especially in uh, texts that are uh, older and uh, we, not, we don't necessarily have the same uh, sensibility. Um, so all in all, the, the aim of the project is to have a look at what the mutual influences are between humor and verse, what it means for humor to be versified, what it means for verse to have jokes in it, and also a number of other stylistic features that are not jokes but function in a similar way. We are studying three uh, separate but overlapping corpora. So Lara Nuc, the doctoral uh, student, is studying the couplets within the vaudeville plays. So those are plays that uh, mix prose dialogues with sung couplets. Niels Couturier is uh, studying songs. There's a very strong tradition in France of uh, singer-songwriters, and he's studying those works, mostly humor humorous songs, of course. Um, and I'm studying uh, poetry in a, in a more traditional sense. 
So our corp corpora overlaps because, of course, some of the poems that I study have been sung, some of uh, the songs have been published in poetry collections, uh, the couplets are sung. So although the two, Lara Nuves and my corpora, don't overlap too much, Nils Couturier overlaps with both of us. Uh, in terms of methodology, we try to blend together distant reading and close reading methods. So we are producing or obtaining a large digital corpus, annotating it with various layers. So there's the versification annotation, which we obtain through the Malherme program at the University of Caen. There's the linguistic annotation, which Petr is uh, producing automatically. There's the annotations of humor that I will be talking in more detail about today, which we do manually. And then all of this goes into a database in order for us to be able to analyze the data and visualize it. And this is all feeding into our close reading of the text because ultimately what we want to achieve is a close reading and text interpretation informed or guided by the data that we analyze. Uh, this is to shed light both on the issues of styles and canons, but also on the specific poetics of uh, singular works. So the issue of annotating humor uh, is far from trivial. I don't think it seems trivial, but it is not trivial indeed. Uh, there's various um, theories of humor which partly overlap and uh, partly don't, and they're not incompatible. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, three main theories uh, seem to dominate the field. One is the theory of superiority, where we laugh at uh, the other in order to show that we are superior to that other. So it's sort of the, the mean laughter, the mean jokes. Um, it's quite important for the cohesion of groups because the in-group is going to laugh at someone who is outside the group in order to clearly state the belonging or not belonging to the group. There's the theory of humor as a release mechanism where somehow something accumulates in us, whether frustrations, uh, silences, uh, pulsions, or humors in a very physical, uh, physiological sense. And all of those somehow have to be released either through a muscular or through a psychological phenomenon of laughter. And this is the reason why we use humor in order to achieve this release that, we, that, that laughter brings us. A third main um, approach to humor is the idea of incongruity and incongruity resolution. This is the one that we oriented ourselves towards because it is a much more uh, functional understanding of humor. It doesn't really wonder why we laugh or even much at what we laugh, or it doesn't uh, really address the usefulness of, uh, of laughter but it uh, addresses the functioning of basically jokes, the, the, the way that uh, humor um, happens, the, the mechanisms behind it. And so we are using the theories of a ling an American linguist called Victor Raskin, um, who uh, explored the idea of script opposition. So this is to, ex to explore the incongruity and the incongruity resolution. Him and his uh, colleague Salvatore Attarto created a number of uh, successive uh, theories which, uh, with somewhat pedantic names. Uh, all of them are basically the same theory, but it keeps getting updated. So they started with the script-based semantic theory of humor and then moved on from theory to theory, but they're all expansions of the same theory. So the idea of the script-based semantic theory of humor is that you have a visible script that you are listening to and which hides a parallel and incompatible script. So there's two ways of understanding what you're hearing, but you're only seeing the visible part and the other part which you don't see is not compatible with the first. And then the punchline happens, which causes a script inversion. All of a sudden you perceive the parallel script which was hidden be behind the visible script and this incongruity is resolved at the moment when you understand it thus creating laughter. And this is the punchline. Uh, they then moved on to the general theory of verbal humor, which is the same theory, but a little bit uh, expanded, and which introduces the idea of jab lines. And those are interesting because just as the punchline is the strong uh, script inversion that comes at the end of the joke, the jab lines are more like little 
incongruities, not, they're not incongruous enough that they will actually script, um, switch the, um, the understanding you have of what you're listening to, but they will make you a little bit uneasy and comfortable. You might notice that there's something that's not quite right, but it's not totally wrong yet. So this is an example of what a jab line and a punch like looks like, respectively. This is a, a line of uh, Lamartine, a romantic poet, un seul être vous manque et tout est dépeuplé, very famous line in French, and uh, the parody of it, un seul être vous manque et tout est dépeuplé. So only the, the Lamartine's line says only one being, you're only missing one being, one person, and everything, and the whole world is empty. And the parody says, uh, you're only missing one tree and the entire world is uh, devoid of poplars. So the play relies on the perfect, almost perfect homophony between être and être. When you first uh, read the beginning of the parody, un seul être vous manque, it's easy to see that the spelling of être is wrong, but it could be very well just be a typo or you could just overlook it. And then only when you get to the end of the line, do you understand that actually there's a link between the tree and one tree and the other tree, le être, I don't know what tree it is, birch, I think, and peuplier, the poplar. Uh, and then you understand that actually this initial apparent typo was not a typo, but it was already incongruent. And uh, so the, the, the jab line sort of build up a bit of tension and they help you also resolve the, the final uh, incongruence. So Raskin and Atardo have uh, provided a number of uh, tools to describe humor. The, they call them knowledge resources. Um, those are all different things that you can use to describe the joke because they're all um, elements that can change the joke. You can change one of those elements without necessarily changing the joke. So this is... Uh, so it, as it happens, uh, the recurring example that uh, Raskin uses throughout his book is a joke about poles. And uh, it's not a good joke, but it's very easy to understand. And um, then he can show with that joke how you can change one um, knowledge resource at a time, one mechanism at a time. And when you only change one mechanism, then everybody notices that it's still the same joke. But if you were to change all the mechanisms at once, you would probably produce a different joke. And those mechanisms have a hierarchy so that the lowest level, the language level, doesn't really affect the, the joke. You would still perfectly understand that it's the same joke, whilst the more abstract level, the script opposition, would create a different, uh, a different uh, proposition. So here in the ex examples that he gives, when he only changes the, the language, it's exactly the same joke, but he can change a number of different other parameters and each parameter in itself, for instance, if you run the target, if you, you replace the poles as a target by the Irishman as a target, it's exactly the same joke. And you often hear people say, oh, I know that joke, but I know it about Belgians. Um, whilst when you get at the top of the um, list, well, at the bottom of the list, but at the top of the abstraction level, the script opposition, if you, if you change the type of scripts that are being opposed, uh, it's actually a different joke. Here, the, the, the new joke where the poles are not changing, uh, they're still changing a light bulb, but it's not about them being intelligent or stupid, it's about them being smelly or not smelly. And so the, here, the script opposition being different, the joke is actually very altered. And so this hierarchy is useful to understand the similarity or non-similarity of different jokes. And then more recently, they moved on to a third version of their um, theory, which we are not using and which is trying to switch to uh, web ontologies. Um, but this is, this is not really working for us. It doesn't really provide anything new to the theory. It's mostly just uh, trying to fit it into a, a different descriptive system, but for us to use it, it would be far too much work and so we're not. To give you an example, this is a joke that Ruskin analyzes very often. It's called the doctor lover joke. So is the doctor home? The patient asked in his bronchial whisper. No, the doctor's young and pretty wife whispered in reply, come right in. Um, 
this is a joke that's easy to understand. Is the patient coming to see the doctor? Is he coming to sleep with the doctor's wife? Um, it's not necessarily so easy to describe as it is to understand. And so that's why Raskin always goes back to it. And this is how he analyzes it to, well, they analyze it through the web ontology, but you see it's a lot of work to create uh, all that uh, all that massive triple store and the result that they get, the visualization of the of the joke that they get is not really useful to us. It's uh, it provides for one joke, a very detailed um, um, scheme that shows how the joke functions. And this is not something that we would be able to, it's too, it's too particular. It's not general enough for you, for us to use in, uh, in our data analysis. So we're not uh, resorting to this third part of the theory of those linguists. And we are going back to the second part, the general theory of verbal humor and those knowledge resources, which we've adapted uh, in order to fill a table of our own in our database, a table just for the jokes which, as I say, does not only include jokes, but also a number of other stylistic features that function in the same way. And we are just as interested in uh, both ends of that spectrum of, uh, of um, stylistic devices, from ones that are obviously jokes to ones that are obviously not jokes. And there's a number of things that are somewhere in between. So we've uh, slightly changed the list of knowledge mechanisms. Um, in particular, the script opposition in uh, Raskin's theory, script, script opposition is described as one knowledge resource and we've divided, in, divided it into two so that we can have the concrete script opposition, which in the case of the lover doctor um, joke would be, is the patient a lover or a patient for instance, uh, and an abstract script opposition, which is like, is this real or not real, or uh, uh, are they human or not human, for instance. Uh, we also added two extra parameters to the table, the jab lines and the punch lines, which uh, allow us to locate where things happen. It happens that occasionally a punchline is not at the end of the joke, for instance, it could be at an another point in the joke, which is interesting. You could have many jab lines or no jab lines at all. Uh, there's a number of things that are uh, very variable and that we're very interested in. Okay, now describing using those um, that framework that we borrow from Raskin and Atardo poses a number of uh, difficulties, and uh, one of them is the logical mechanisms. So the logical mechanisms are um, basically in the case of the lover doctor joke, it would be the ambiguity of the status is the, you know, the, the person is coming to the door, his status is ambiguous. Or um, in the, yeah, sorry. So the list of logical mechanisms, it could be homophony, like in the case of uh, un seul être vous manque that I gave with the tree, um, the trees instead of the loneliness. Um, here is the homophony between être and être. It could be a number of things that is used as a logical mechanism. In the cases that we're interested in, it happens that quite often the logical mechanisms that are used happen to be the versification itself. So the joke will be based precisely on the presence of a caesura, and it's a logical step for the reader to expect something to happen at the rhyme or to happen at the caesura, a number of things to happen because they know the versification rules uh, require those things to happen. So it was very difficult to create a satisfactory list of logical mechanisms. This is an example I'm showing you. It's just one list amongst many lists of possible logical mechanisms. It seems like um, whenever a researcher is trying to tag a corpus of jokes, they produce um, ad hoc lists of logical mechanisms that will fit their purpose. So this is exactly what we do. Um, it makes us a little bit unhappy in the sense that um, it means that our data in terms of interoperability um, will, be, will be lacking 
from that point of view because we we cannot expect another team to have chosen the same exact um, logical mechanisms to describe another corpus of humorous occurrences so this is this is a, a downside of this uh, description framework as far as we're concerned it's not an immediate threat to our work in the sense that what we're trying to achieve is to describe our corpus and to compare things within our corpus and we have three different corpora and because we use the same list of logical mechanisms we will be able to compare how jokes happen and how they function and which logical mechanisms they're based upon between our three, corp three corpora. So this is just something that saddens us a little bit, but I don't think there's really a way out in the sense that it really seems like everybody is uh, also creating their own list of logical mechanisms. We also didn't want to have a very, very long list. So we have a very short one that we can add to. So whenever we encounter a logical mechanism during our tagging process and this is not in the list we can add to the list it's okay uh, also another difficulty was the various levels of abstraction for script oppositions um, from the highly abstract to the moderately abstract to the concrete level uh, raskin and atardo differ differentiate those three levels but if you follow their works from year to year from decade to decade a lot of uh, script oppositions move between the two first categories are sometimes considered highly abstract and then in another book other article they're moderately abstract such as life death is sometimes a highly abstract script opposition sometimes it's moderately abstract so we have decided not to decide on whether things were highly or moderately abstract and we have only two levels for our script oppositions the very concrete level such as la face la fesse and the abstract level in which we have a very reduced list of possible script oppositions to choose from um now so this is our website now i think i still i have oh i still have a bit a little bit of time if that's okay with you i would like to Absolutely, you can use extra time. We, we are very like informal uh, in, in, in informal state here. So feel free Perfect. to go on. So this is the um, database that uh, Petr Plechac has built for us. And uh, it includes a number of things, including a database editor in which we can directly access poems in order to tag uh, jokes as we see fit and I'm going to tag for you a poem that I particularly love and that is a very good example if I can find it there so it's already tagged mm. so I can just explain to you the way it's tagged so this poem is a word play it's difficult to notice and i've read that poem for many years again and again and i've always really liked it it's got only one line et l'unique cordeau des trompettes marines a very beautiful alexandrine extremely regular and i never spotted the joke in it uh, it just seemed like an extremely mysterious poem to me um and then now that i understand all of a sudden i saw the joke and now it's all i can see and the the, the poem has a completely different um color to me so anyway the the joke can you see my uh, cursor uh yes good i can see so the joke is on the it's overlapping the title and the beginning of the line so chantre a chantre is a, a singer someone who yeah a poet or a singer and chanterelle is an instrument that has only one chord it's a chord instrument a sort of a violin but it has only one chord um oh, no 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 i'm sorry this is wrong i'm pardon me let me start again chanterelle is not an instrument chanterelle is a chord in an instrument when you have an instrument with several chords the chanterelle is the chord that gives the highest note of all the chords and une trompette marine although une trompette is of course just like in english a trumpet in trompette marine, on the other hand, is a chord instrument that has only one chord. 
And so the poem, instead of saying chant, which means singer, and the translation of the poem would be, and the only chord of a marine trumpet, which doesn't mean a lot, but is very beautiful to look at. Uh, actually, chanterelle is indeed the only chord in the instrument that's called a trompette marine and that has only one chord. So it is, it is the highest chord and the only chord. So it's difficult to tag the title because for only one poem where the title is included in the wordplay, we weren't going to include that functionality in our database editor. But basically what we do is that we select all the words that are going to form part of the joke and create a joke out of it. And this joke can uh, include all the knowledge mechanisms, all the knowledge resources that I showed earlier. So here in this case, uh, the question is whether it's uh, normal abnormal or uh, um, live or not live, because a singer a poet is a live person. It's also a human person, but it's not uh, it's not uh, the case of the musical instrument or the chord of the musical instrument. This is not human and not alive. Uh, so the question is whether this is also actual or non-actual. So we can here select all the logic, the script oppositions that we think um, form the, the, the meaning of that joke. And here, this is the second part of the script opposition. So I'm opposing two very concrete scripts. Those ones are the abstract ones and those are concrete, either the chanterelle which is the chord, or chantre L, which is what's printed on the paper. Um, the situation of the poem I, is just a monostitch. There's no particular situation. Uh, there's nothing particular to say about the language. There is no target, but we could have a target. Target is a facultative field. So here we can add, we have a list of pre-existing pre targets, such as, you know, women or... Uh, uh religion a number of things can be typically found as targets of jokes but uh, we can add more if we have the butt of a joke happens not to be in the list we can add more um the logical mechanism here is homophony because chanterelle chanterelle are homophonous but uh, we have a number of uh, logical mechanisms that we could choose from we can also choose more than one and here i also select a juxtaposition because the two are um, juxtaposed and the um, narrative strategy very often of a, either question and answer nature or of a narrative nature it's very often when you tell a joke either it's presented in the form of a dialogue or it's presented in the form of a narration here it's not it's presented in the form of a list and this so we can add uh, a number of so those are the Q, Q a narrative, narrative Q&A are the basic um, narrative strategies that you tend to find. And whenever we add a new value to the list, this is prefixed with other so that uh, we don't get completely mixed up. Um, and we have added a new field, another field, which is a versification mechanism. It's a bit cheeky of us because really those versification mechanisms should be part of the other logical mechanisms but because we have a special focus on versification we wanted to be able to tag those specifically and uh, so we so far only have encountered uh, instances of uh, jokes that were based either on the caesura on an enjambment or on the rhyme scheme but uh, i'm sure over time we will need to add new values to that list which is not a problem and as a comment i simply added that this is an alexandrine because the, the so that uh, um it's it's an important uh, part of the of the joke that you also get lulled by that very familiar very classical meter of the alexandrine and in a way it also serves the opacity of the joke which is difficult to spot also because it simply appears to be a very mysterious, very long um, line. The Alexandrine is a very long line. Um, and then once we've tagged the joke itself, we can then add to it jab lines. 
and punchlines. So the jab line here is trompette marine because this is when you understand or you're supposed to understand or you, if, if, if you know about the trompette marine, this is when you understand that uh, that uh, chanterelle and the only chord referred to a musical instrument, the trompette marine. So this is the punchline. And trompette, even though it's also already part of the punchline, is already also a jab line because when you hear about an, uh, an unique chord, so a single chord of a trumpet, it does seem a little bit incongruous. The incongruity is not complete yet and it's not resolved, but it's unexpected to see something be described as the only chord of a trumpet, since a trumpet obviously has no chord. Mm, so this is it. I will now stop, if I can find you again, I will now stop sharing my. Uh, presentation and there and thank you very much for listening to it <laughs>